and welcome to the Keys to Therapy. Today's guest is Danielle. Hi, Danielle. Hi, how are you? Good. How are you doing? Um, I'm pretty good today. It's a little early here in California. But... Yeah, <laughs> very early. I was sleeping at 7 a.m. here. <laughs> Not a morning person. But with kids, I guess you kind of have to be a morning person. Yeah, I don't have a choice. My son wakes up at 6.50 every morning. So um, yeah, I'm always up. Yeah. See, I have dogs. So even if they wake up early, they go back to bed after they go out. <laughs> Kids, no, they're up and they're good to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, if you want to tell the audience a little bit about who you are and what you do, that would be great. Okay. Um, so my name is Danielle Peters. I'm a marriage family therapist in California. I specialize in working with parents of neurodivergent kids. Oh, um, good. Yeah. That's awesome. That's a really good niche too. Yeah, I've, um, I started doing that a long time ago and it's just kind of turned into a specialty that I have a lot of experience and energy that I put into, so. Oh, I bet. And there's such a need for it too. Yeah. Yes, it is. there is. It's, um, I find that there's so many services for the kids, but there isn't anything for the adults mm. and the parents and the parents need a lot of support in understanding their child and figuring out like what the next steps are. Yeah, absolutely. Cause there's sometimes some grief. I think that comes with the diagnosis like that. Mm -hmm. And like yeah. you said, parents also, I've worked with a few parents, um, over the years whose kids have been, you know, on the spectrum or something's been going on with them and the toll mm -hmm. that it takes on the parents to make yeah. sure their kids get all the services. They're at all the appointments. They're doing the um, meetings at school to make sure that all the accommodations are happening. Like it's a lot of stress. Yeah. It's a lot of stress. There's a lot, there's a lot of grief and it is a continuous grief. It's not something that's like short and sweet. Mm -hmm. It's not that grief is ever sweet, but um, it's something that comes up over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And it's really like, I tell my clients that grief is about, um, is about something being different than what you expected. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you don't appreciate and love your child for who they are, but it's just that things are differently, are going differently. And so um, you really change the... You, the grief process is saying goodbye to the things you thought that that you would have so that you can let in the things that you do have and appreciate and love those. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. I think there's so much that the focus ends up being on the kid. Let's make mm -hmm. sure they have what they need. Let's make sure yeah. that they're surviving. Let's make sure they're doing well. And all of that is great, but I think you're right. There's not a lot of attention paid to the parents. It almost feels like they're not allowed to talk about some of that mm -hmm. stuff because yeah. it's got to be about the kid so yeah. and there is this like I there's this kind of stereotype in the community of like the autism mom that makes their child stuff all about them but mm -hmm. there is this that also kind of silences a lot of parents from talking about the feelings that they're having and you can't be your best parent if you are not dealing with all of your feelings and emotions and stress. Yeah. So it's, so that's what I help parents. with. That's amazing. Yeah. I can definitely yeah. think of some people who could have used somebody who specialized in that. A lot of them came to me for like anxiety or work mm -hmm. stress or whatever else. And then as you dig deeper, you're like, oh, there's this whole other layer here that some of them don't even realize is impacting yeah. their own mental health. So. Especially since it's like, that's their day to day. So they don't yeah. think about how it would be impacting their mental health. And then there's also this part of like, as a therapist, if you don't have any lived experience with a child, a neurodivergent child, or um, you haven't worked with families who are experiencing this, a lot of times you don't understand the, the realities of it. Like mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of therapists will, you know, prescribe the typical self-care, you know, take a bath, do this, do that. And it's like, a lot of my parents cannot leave their children alone. No. And so, you know, taking a bath doesn't work. And so I work with them to find spaces of self-care that are doable and are reasonable. That's great. Yeah. Cause it's not just the, like the handout. 
of yeah. get your nails yep. done, take a bath, get some extra sleep. It's like we're talking about sometimes your kid's up, that's it. You're up too. Yeah. So yeah. And kids with autism and ADHD very rarely sleep the whole night. Mm-hmm. And so like you end up with people who have been going on like maybe two hours of sleep for the last five years. So it's, you know, so when you say get more sleep, yeah. that's not, it's not that easy. <laughs> no. And that's such like a privileged thing to be able to say a lot of those mm-hmm. self-care things yeah. that people tend to like prescribe or give us homework. Um, they don't understand that there's not the capacity. It's like, not that the parents don't mm-hmm. want to do it. There's just, no, yeah. they're not capable of within their normal schedule and the kids demands. Yeah. I've noticed a lot with some of the clients I've worked with, um, the fights with the schools too. And then the Mm -hmm. shame that comes from having to, you know, just to find that line between being that advocate, but not being aggressive, but sometimes you kind of have to be like, there's just so much that's involved in it. And I think, you know, I'm glad that we're talking about this because it kind of goes into what I wanted to talk about today for new therapists out there who, Mm -hmm. I know in the beginning, I don't know if it was like this for you in your career, but in the beginning, I worked in community mental health and I had to see everybody and do everything. And I didn't really have a choice. Um, so I'd see a four year old and then a 60 year old. Go ahead. Yeah. So my story is actually a little bit different. I started, so before I, while I was getting my master's degree, I worked in, um, respite care, which is, Mm -hmm. um, caregiving for families with neurodivergent kids and kids with, um, complex medical needs. Mm -hmm. And, um, then I moved into doing other services as a, when I got my master's, I ended up doing other services. I did in homework. I did, um, something called recreation therapy. I did, I did something called parenting support services, which is where I would work with, um, what, what we call here regional center clients who were parents and help them to maintain their household, be able to keep their kids, um, things like that. So I've been working with um, families who are affected by neurodivergence and complex medical needs since I started my career. But then, so I did that for a really long time. And then when I moved into private practice, I was like, for some reason in my head, I was like, oh, I'm a generalist now. So and it was kind of a hard learning curve. For me. <laughs> yeah, it was the opposite. So I went into private practice and just I started with insurance and I just like took everybody and mm-hmm. saw everybody and I had a couple of like for so to me having a niche and having an ideal client is really really important because it allows you to work with the people that you do your best work with. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is like, I do my best work with parents of neurodivergent kids. I have the most experience with that. I've gotten um, specialized training on top of all of the years that I've worked with families with neurodivergent kids. Um, And, and I connect the best with that experience because I I have personal experience as well. Mm -hmm. Um, So that those are my, like my flow clients. Those are the clients who I walk into the room I sit down and it doesn't feel like I'm working it, you know, I love every minute of it. I feel like I'm helping them. Don't feel stuck. I would say 99% of the time I don't get in the spaces where I feel stuck. Yeah. And I, um, I leave feeling energized. Whereas when I'm not seeing my ideal clients, like for example, I don't do very well with angry men and <laughs> when I leave a session with an angry male, I very often feel drained. Mm -hmm. I walk away like questioning every thing that I said every, so it really is for me, the having my niche and my ideal client is it's a really big deal because it makes such a difference in the amount in the like level of work I do and Mm -hmm. do my best work, but I feel better about what I'm doing. And I think, and my clients get, better, you know, better care from me. So it's, it's really, really important. And it took me a while to figure that out, but the path that I took, like made it so obvious to me that the niche is where my ability to have balances. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that that's really important for new therapists in particular to hear, because I think most people are placed in positions like I was, where you kind of get everybody and anything and it's basically like figure it out. So, Mm -hmm. and at that point, it's really, it's a lot tougher to figure out who your ideal client is when you're just trying to survive and see all these random people while also battling like imposter syndrome and everything else. But (laughs) To kind of, I guess, then go back towards these terms. So maybe newer therapists, they mm-hmm. probably, I never heard ideal client. I never heard niche. I never heard any of that in grad school. It was kind of like, just work you, with the people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just work with the people, work with everybody. Yeah. You're expected to be an expert in everything. Absolutely. So I think a lot of people graduate and then they start feeling like, I don't, they feel more lost. I don't know who I like. Mm-hmm. I don't know who I want to work with. Yeah. So can you explain a little bit about what it means to have an ideal client? Like what, what does that even mean? So the, an ideal client is the client that you work best with, but it can often like I, so I I also work as a copywriter. And one of the things I do in my copywriting job is help people identify their ideal clients because there is a whole marketing aspect to the ideal client as well that if you want, we can talk about later um but the part of so what you so where i was going with that is that often people will be like oh well if you ask someone who do you love working with who do you Mm -hmm. do your best work with a lot of times they'll say i love postpartum moms i you know they'll have like a list of Mm -hmm. people that they love working with and so one of the things so if one of the things that I do is I help people like really narrow down who that person is, but you can like the ideal client, it can be something for me, like, like it is for me where it's, you know, a group of people who you can kind of like identify from certain characteristics, mm-hmm. like outside characters. Is like, oh, I love working with men with depression, or I love working with, overwhelmed busy moms I love working you know it could be something along those lines yeah or it can be the feelings that the clients are going through Mm so you know if someone says to me um I like working with postpartum moms and um 20 something men going through transition and um let me think of another good one and 15 year olds who are questioning their gender identity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so if they, if they say that to me, then the, what I do from there is I say, okay, well, what are the feelings that all three of these clients have? What are, what are they experiencing? What's, the, what is the similarity between the three of them? And then I help them to identify that similarity. Mm. And a lot of times it's like all three of those are going through transition and so then like the ideal client has is having has this like set of feelings and so that's who you're looking for and then we like aim your marketing in that direction yeah that makes and, sense like going through yeah. maybe like identity crises or whatever mm-hmm. that common thread is amongst yeah. the groups because yeah. i think sometimes people feel like ideal client needs to be just like a diagnosis or just Mm -hmm. an age group or something like super narrow. And maybe it's not that narrow from how you're describing it. It sounds like it could be either, like you said, common characteristics or common Mm -hmm. feelings. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It can really be like common feelings, like, and it doesn't have to be like, you know, like you said, it doesn't have to be a certain diagnosis or even the certain, certain feelings. It can be that like, I'm feeling lost, figuring out, you know, where I'm going and what I'm doing. It can be things along those lines that it's not as identifiable as like depression Mm -hmm. or 50 something women or something along those lines. Yeah. And from what I've read about like ideal clients and niche and stuff like that, it sounds like too, you don't want to use words that the clients won't know. And I think Mm -hmm. a lot of people do that, right? So like maybe figuring out, like you said, I like how you said more of the feelings versus Mm -hmm. diagnosis because sometimes clients don't identify what they've been through as trauma. 
But if yeah. we're like, I work yep. with trauma, they might be like, well, I don't have trauma. I've never lied to me. Yeah. But yeah. it's maybe they're not understanding, you know, how, like you said, those common threads. So maybe their trauma mm-hmm. was a car accident, but in their mind, yeah. trauma is something that's like, you watched someone die. And so um, I think that that sounds like that'd be probably an important characteristic too, to really focus on the clients that you like the most like you work mm-hmm. the best with you relate yep. to the best so it sounds yep. like it's those threads but the only way to find those is really to kind of focus on your own feelings as a therapist and your own I guess um what's the word for it energy levels maybe like you mm-hmm. were describing with your clients yeah. like you feel energized yeah. after you see yeah them. yeah so it is so one of the things that I suggest to figure out who your ideal client is so say you're like moving from community mental health and you're starting to look at going into private practice is what I would do is I would go through your caseload and Mm -hmm. figure out the ones where you feel most present in the room and most confident. Mm. You feel, um, you have that energized feeling when you leave the room Yeah, and you feel like you connect with the most. And then I would you know, figure out who those clients are and look at the similarities there. And that's probably your ideal client. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense because it's going to be those people when they walk out, you're like, oh, that was a great session. Even if it's a hard one, you still feel Mm -hmm. good about it. Um, And you're looking forward to seeing them next. I think sometimes, you know, especially again, when you're given everybody, there's going to be certain clients that you're just like, all right, here we go today. (laughs) I have this person on my list. And that would definitely be in that other category of maybe what you Mm -hmm. don't necessarily want to work with, which is sometimes just as important as figuring out who you do. But for some of the newer newer therapists out there who maybe are scared to niche down or feel like they Mm -hmm. need to be a generalist because they don't want to close any doors or, you know, anything else, but then they're kind of taking on everybody. Like, can you explain a little bit about why you think it's important for therapists to have Mm -hmm. a niche? So for the therapists themselves, so business-wise, Mm-hmm. It's easier to to market your practice. Yeah. I know that that's a really scary word, especially for newer therapists. Mm-hmm. Um, but really what it means is that I, finding your ideal client and having a niche allows you to tell other therapists who you work work with so that when they when you're you know, talking to referral sources, they know who to send you. If you say to them, oh, I'll just take everybody. Well, when they get, you know, a client with depression, they're going to think the the first person they're going to think of isn't going to be you because you didn't give them a specific Uh niche of who you work with. The first person they're going to think of, think about is, you know, Jenna over here who focuses on depression. Yeah. And then when they get someone with the anxiety, they're going to think about, you know, James over here who told, told her that he focuses on adolescent anxiety. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, when you have an itch, so it, it helps because you're doing work that you love and you don't have as many of the clients that just feel like a drain on your energy, but it also helps because when you're doing your marketing, other people know who to send you. And then, you know, when you're, when you're actually doing like advertising and things like that, or even on your website, you are, if you're writing to everybody, nobody will see themselves in their, in your writing. Whereas if you're writing to one particular client, there are going to be other people who will see themselves in your writing and, and reach out to you. Like I get plenty of parents just in general, because they read what I've written and they're in my website copy. And they're like, I don't have a neurodivergent child, but this really connects with me. And I think I want to work with you. And so best compliment ever. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I love that. So there's a fear that like niching down is going to prevent people from coming to see Uh you. And that's really not necessarily the case. What it, what it does is it lets people know, like, who you really specialize in, but then you'll get other people that come and see your copy and are like, yes, this is me. Even though this isn't hundred percent me, I want to see you. 
Yeah. So. And I think, like you said, referral sources, like that's mm-hmm. huge because yeah. even if you're working at a group practice or even if you're just at like, I don't know, an agency, even within the agency, depending mm-hmm. on how big it is, sometimes, you know, you, they'll be able to say, oh, this person would be a great fit. Yeah. But if you yeah. do see everybody, then you're going to probably fall through the cracks. Cause yeah. like you mentioned, people are going to want to send there. There's going to be certain people that like pain in their mind when they hear certain issues mm-hmm. and they do consult calls with certain clients and they're gonna be like, I have the perfect person for you and yeah. they'll think of you. So, and then, like you said, on that other scale, later down the road with certain therapists, if they go for the private practice route, their website. So mm-hmm. that was something I was worried about. It was like, I've seen kind of everybody. And then now if I'm going to pick a specific group, like who are they? What does that mean? But it's funny now I've had, gosh, one of the best compliments was a teenage boy, which you're already like, they're not Mm -hmm. out here looking for therapists that often. He was like, you know, somebody gave me your name when I was talking about like what happened, like what I've been going through. And he said, I Mm -hmm. read your website in this one part where you said this. And he quoted me back to me. Mm -hmm. I was like, I'm dead. He was like, that's, that was me. That was me. And so I was like, wow. But It just shows like you were saying with the parents too, for your website, like Mm -hmm. if you were having the right copy, the right person's going to be like, I'll do what I got to do to see you. So yeah, exactly. That's amazing. And then they're going to send their other friends who are going through the same type of stuff to see you too. (laughs) So that's great. And I love that you kind of broke down that myth because I see a lot of in these Facebook groups for therapists, a lot of them are like, I'm scared to niche down, or Mm -hmm. I don't want to box myself in, but you can also change your niche or ideal client later on. Right. Yep. And that's, that's the thing is the niche is it's going to change as you get older. It's going to change as you change. It's going to change as you, you know, change your therapeutic style. You know, you're going to be doing your thing. And then all of a sudden you're going to see, I don't know, IFS or EFT or something like that and like start doing training and then your niche is probably going to change. Yeah. And it's just, that's, it's kind of how it's like the life of the therapist, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, you start with a certain group and you, your niche changes. Like my niche I originally started with, and this, this term isn't really used anymore, but I, I started with special needs, parents Mm -hmm. of special needs kids. And, um, but the more work I did, the more I was like, you know, I do, you know, I will see these clients. I will see the, um, parents of complex medical needs kids. I, I will see those clients, but the ones that I do the best work with, are parents of neurodivergent mm-hmm. kids and that's so that so I just kept niching down and niching down and niching down and um it, that's been been a real journey for me it's been really interesting and so you know and I know I have another friend who she started with um law enforcement couples and has kind of as she's grown now she's working, she sees a lot of um, entrepreneurial women. And so, you know, which is like a totally different group of people, but there's also like, there's similar feelings there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but she's just like, as she's changed as a therapist, her niche has changed. And it's, you know, so you don't have to be stuck with the niche and if you you know if you start working with more of the people in your niche and you're like I don't know if I really want to do this you can change yeah it's, you know you're not married to it no and like you said it's just then remarketing whether that's talking to people within the agency or out of the group practice and being like here's more of who I'd like to see or changing website copy or you know networking and letting people know like actually this is who I work with now you know yeah. like it's fine. It can change. So yeah. you're not married to it. And even people who are married get divorced. So like you can go ahead and separate yeah. from that yeah. niche if you want. And yeah. I love how you said it changes too. Cause I feel like mine goes up in age every year mm-hmm. as my youngest clients go up in age too. Mm-hmm. So now I'm like, do I even want to work with teenagers? Cause I'm only going to have one left and the rest are going to be college age, like by this yeah. fall. So maybe I just want to stick with that, but Yeah. And even when you mentioned the feelings, I thought about, I have a lot of like, I see like high functioning anxiety in Mm -hmm. later teens, early adulthood, but I also have people in their forties. I have somebody in their sixties that it's the Mm -hmm. same feelings. So even if maybe it wasn't 
exactly geared towards them. Some of the stuff on the website, it's like you said, it's the same feeling. So you're not boxing people out either yeah. Yeah. by and declaring ages. And I think that that is the, that's especially newbie therapists, like mm-hmm. that's their fear. Their fear is if I niche down, I'm boxing people out. I'm mm-hmm. not able to help everybody. I'm not, you know, and that, but that that's the thing is like, as therapists, it's unfair to put the expectation on our shoulders. And I know that this happens in mental health. And I know that this happens in the beginning of our career. And there's a reason for that. Like, if you do that in the beginning of your career, you can then figure out who you like and enjoy working with. And then you can like really specialize moving on. But it's like, if you are seeing everyone, you can't specialize in a way that you can't go and seek more information because you know you're you're not going to go to a training that's about anxiety depression and everything else Mm -hmm. like you're going to go to a training about you know this particular treatment for depression or this particular treatment for trauma and so you know picking a niche also allows you to seek out specialized training in your niche and to like you know get better at what you do and improve and it's it's important (laughs) Right. Do you think it can help prevent burnout too? Yeah, I definitely do because, and because being able to identify who you work with, like you're not as spread thin, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Like, you know, when you're seeing someone who has everything or a different, different people that have different issues if you run across something that you get stuck with, you end up researching it. And so, whereas if you're seeing a lot of the same client, like, Mm -hmm. and you end up getting stuck on something, you're researching something that's going to help another client as well. Whereas it's not necessarily as likely when you're a generalist. Mm, Yeah. I picture being a generous generalist, kind of like playing twister (laughs) where Mm -hmm. it's like left foot blue. (laughs) And then you're like, you know, right hand red in the back. And so then you're just kind of like all spread out because you're too all over the map where Mm -hmm. you're right. It's so much more efficient to then go to this training for this specific thing that you're niching down in versus, you know, or more efficient to find a tactic or resource my dog um mm-hmm. <laughs> resource or tactic for one specific issue that you know many of your clients have so it's just a more efficient use yeah. of your time yeah so I think that that makes sense with burnout too because if you're seeing people all over the map and it's clients that don't necessarily recharge you or that yeah. you don't feel you do your best work with you're harder on yourself you don't feel as great about mm-hmm. the sessions maybe they're not getting as much maybe they're not sticking with you as a therapist yeah. and yeah. that's hurting you so yeah there's a lot. Yeah. There are a lot of reasons to niche down and, you know, we really need to do everything we can to prevent burnout. And Mm -hmm. if niching helps that, which, which it does, like I'm not only am I a better therapist, but I, like, like I said, I leave those sessions feeling energized versus feeling drained. And so, you know, you want more of those energizing sessions and those draining sessions because you can only you can only do so many sessions in the first place, but mm-hmm. you can only do so many of the draining sessions before like, you know, your whole week just feels awful. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're really protecting yourself, which is going to then make you a better therapist for your clients. Yep. So it's self-care. Right. That's the right kind of self-care. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's not take a bath. It's like, no, really assess your caseload. And mm-hmm. uh, which brings me to another question is, you know, I know you mentioned with the caseload, um, one of the steps that new therapists could take is maybe looking at the people that they see and figuring yeah. out who energizes them or recharges them. Can you think of any other additional like exercises or steps that new therapists can take to figure out that ideal client or niche? So definitely figuring out who in your caseload energizes you, but then also like figuring out who you feel you connect with the most, Mm -hmm. like not just the energizing part of things, but like who, when you're in the room, who are the clients where you're like laser focused and you're like there present without like a fight. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that those clients where you're, um, fighting yourself to stay focused with them, it, that's, that's an indication that that's not your ideal client. But Mm -hmm. if you're like really focused and you're really able to like, you know, just 
be in the moment with them the whole time, I think that's another indication that this is your ideal client. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that you can do is like really, like it doesn't necessarily, so say you're working in an agency that, I don't know, just sees like addictions or something like that. And like, you're pretty sure after working there that the, these are not your ideal clients. Mm -hmm. um, Often you can do, there's a lot of writing exercises that you can do to help you identify who your ideal clients are. And so one of, one of those things that you might want to do is, you know, sit down and write, even if you haven't had that much experience working with them at this point, like write the people, write like a letter to the person that you think that you would work the best with, or write down a, um, almost like a character description that you would do for a novel like write down, write, write about them, write their age, write what they're going mm -hmm. through, write the, the feelings that they're having. Like it really, so for me, ideal client is a lot more about the feelings than mm -hmm. actually like the broader characteristics, but, you know, write, write a character description that you would write to, you know, for a novel or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that'll start heading you in the right direction. And the thing is, is like, when you're going into private practice, like it's going to be adjusted. Like the, you know, you're going to write your first brand of copy and write your, you know, have a good idea of who your first ideal client is. You're going to go out, you're going to market it. You're going to get a couple of them and you're going to be like, this is a great group of people, but I'd like, I really like this specific client in this group, or this is a great group of people, but maybe I want to see them a little bit younger mm -hmm. or maybe I want to see them a little bit older. And so like, it's, it's a start. So. Yeah. And I think for somebody like you who writes copy, I feel mm -hmm. like doing some of those exercises, if they can't necessarily piece it all together, but yeah. they have a general idea mm -hmm. to provide that to somebody like you to be like, here's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. You can also help them sort through that. Yeah. Yeah. And definitely like one of the things I do as a copywriter and uh, this besides the writing, which I really enjoy the writing, mm -hmm. but this is one of my favorite parts of um, doing the copywriting is part of my process is we have an hour long session that I call the um, ideal client clarity session Ooh. where we sit for an hour and we talk about your ideal client and it's, you know, it serves to help me to do the writing later on, yeah. but it also really helps to like hone down exactly who your ideal client is and like who you want to be working with and, you know, all of those, those details. And it's, it is so much fun to do. Like it's, I love sitting with someone and like really figuring out like who their flow client is, who the person they do the best work with, because it's all different. Every yeah. single therapist has a different ideal client and it's so fun to help you to figure out who they are. Like, mm -hmm. it's just, it's one of the biggest joys of my life is oh. to like figure this out and to help you figure out because I know that by helping you figure it out, like I'm helping you to do a better job. I'm helping you to feel better in life in general. Like it's, it's a big deal to have an idea of who that ideal client is. So yeah, I could see that trickling down. You're like helping like what is it? The butterfly effect. You're helping like all these people after, right? Because if yeah. you're helping this one therapist figure out who their ideal client is, who they do the best work with, you're preventing them from burning out, which then makes them a better therapist for all their future clients. Okay. And then in another way, you helping them put that copy together is going to help the people who are reading it go, they get me, like they understand me. I need to work with them. And so yep. now you're helping that client, which then helps their family, their relationships, mm -hmm. their whoever. So yeah. by doing the one session with them and then obviously writing and everything else, you're helping so many people in this process. Yeah. Which yeah. is huge. That's cute. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing that I think you said that's really important too is how you said every therapist that comes has a different niche, right? Mm -hmm. There's a different ideal yeah. client. Yep. So for the newbie therapist, maybe who are like, God, I feel so bad. If I say I only want to work with, you mm -hmm. know, like you mentioned men with depression, then mm -hmm. I'm cutting out women. I'm cutting out kids. I'm cutting out all these other things. Yeah. But like you said, there's so many other people who that is their ideal client yeah. is that yep. teenager or that mom or whoever else. So yeah. you're not actually cutting out anybody. You're opening that space for them to see somebody who fits them better. 
Yeah, exactly. And, we, you know, we know that that is that one of the most important characteristics of the therapist, therapist client relationship is the fit. Yeah. And so if we can find our right fit clients, like that's going to help us a lot, mm -hmm. but if we can help other clients find their ideal, like ideal fit therapist, they're going to get the work done. Whereas a lot of times, like if you're not with an ideal fit therapist, you often don't get, don't make as much progress as you would otherwise. Like yeah. I'm, I mean, in my personal life, I have been searching for a therapist for years and I finally found someone that really, I really connect with mm -hmm. and I'm doing better work with her because mm -hmm. we, you know, she's an ideal fit. So, yeah. it, you know, the ideal fit is a big deal and you're not, especially if you get to know that the other therapists in your community and the, the net. That their niches and what they do mm -hmm. like you're not leaving people out by not working with certain groups like you know I just I don't work with angry males and they, yeah. they don't come to me anymore but right. I don't I don't do it anymore I know better than to do it I know that they're going to be better off with someone else and I know I'm going to be better off with them mm -hmm. working with someone else and so you know I know who in the community that if I come if someone reaches out to me and and looking for therapy and they fit that particular group that I send them to this client and yeah. because of this therapist and so like that's part of it too is knowing like if you're feeling bad that you're like leaving groups out you can, you know, get to know the other therapists in your community so that you know who to send them to. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's such a good point too. That's really good advice for new therapists. Cause if you're networking a lot, you're getting your name out there. Maybe one of the biggest questions to ask is who do you work with or who's your ideal client? Yeah. So as you're yeah. putting your referral list together, especially if there is any of that lingering guilt of turning people mm -hmm. away or stuff yeah. like that, you feel good about, well, I'm not the best fit, but I know who is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a really good tip. So yeah, that's something I need to keep building up. <laughs> so that's a good reminder for me personally. Um, well, is there any other tips or suggestions in general when it comes to helping new therapists? I think it, it really is just as a new therapist, finding your ideal client is, it's part of finding your identity as a therapist. Like they becoming a therapist and becoming like getting into private practice it really is it's a growth process you know the you start with the basics in grad school and then you get a little bit more specialized in your uh -huh. in your next job and then you know more specialized as a private practice person but the thing is is it's it is like you're finding your identity. And so if you remember what it was like to be finding your identity as a teenager, like mm -hmm. you kind of tried a bunch of stuff on. And so it's okay to do that. Like, don't be hard on yourself. If your the, your search for your ideal client takes you a while, like it's, it's okay. It's just, it's part of the process mm -hmm. and giving yourself a little bit of grace in that process is, is okay treat yourself the way you would treat your clients, but, you know, really recognize that this is, it's an identity finding space and it's going to take a while and that's okay. Yeah. And to be patient, I think people either don't think about it at all with the ideal client or they <laughs> think about it too much. Yeah. There's not yeah. a lot of in between. Like you feel like you should know who you do your best work with. And it's like you said, there's, I think for me personally, it took years to mm -hmm. figure that out because I worked in so many different settings and I'm like, okay, I'm kind of getting a feel for this. And then, mm -hmm. but I don't really know. And then the next place being like, okay, I kind of like these people or these issues yeah. the best, but I'm not totally sure. And sometimes it was more obvious what I didn't want to work with than what yeah. I, yeah. so, and sometimes that takes up more of your brain space because you're more drained or dreading mm -hmm. certain sessions or whatever else. So I think it is very important to be patient with that because like you said too, you're going to change and your life's going to change. So yep. you may think it's one and it switches. Like I've known therapists who really like working with kids and then they have kids, like kids with trauma, for example, and then they mm -hmm. have kids and they're yeah. like, I can't do this anymore. It's too triggering. It's, it's a lot. And so then they change paths and that's yeah. okay. Yep. 
And that that's definitely been a part of my path. Like I used to work directly with the kids. Yeah. And when I had my own kids. I was like, mm, nope, I need to save my kid energy for my kids. Mm-hmm. So I work with the parents. Absolutely. Yeah. So it can and, change. Yeah, it can change. And it is just a part of the process. Mm-hmm. Yay. So be nice. I like that. <laughs> treat yourself like you treat your clients because we can't be hypocrites out here. And a lot of us are like, yeah, put your phone down 30 minutes before bed. And then it's like me in bed on my phone <laughs> before I go to sleep. Yeah. So like there's yeah. certain things that, yeah, we don't always practice, but something like this, we really should. Cause yeah. we're our worst critics sometimes, especially when you're new and there's all that imposter syndrome. Yep. Be nice. But well, is there anything that you're working on or anything that you would like to share? So, um, I do have a, I have my private practice, but I also have a copywriting business. Um, I talked a little bit about like the ideal client clarity sessions. So I do that, but I also write, I write website copy. I'll do your full website or I'll do, you know, just a page here and there if you prefer that. Um, I also do blogs for therapists. If you're in that space and feeling the pressure to write blogs, I'll write them for you. Um, I really like, like I said, one of like I enjoy doing it because I'm connecting you to your ideal clients, and by doing that, I'm you know helping everybody. Um, so I really, really do, and I really enjoy that. But yeah, so then you have this side business, which I think is great mm-hmm. because it also shows too that there's a passion for everything you've shared this episode. Yeah. You've made a whole yeah. business out of it, and helping other yep. people get to that point. Yeah. Yeah. The finding your ideal client is just such a big step in your career. And it really does. It, it helps prevent burnout and it really helps you to feel like you're doing your best work. And it's a big deal. Oh. I love that you're helping people with that. Like I said, I was never talked to about that in grad mm-hmm. school or honestly, any place I've ever worked. Yeah. No yeah. one encouraged that. Well, the, you know, community mental health or even some of the group practices, like there is fear around like having someone niche down because then they can't just like dump every client that comes your your way Mm -hmm. on. Right. And so they want you to be as, as generalist as possible, but it's, it's not what's best for the therapist and it's not what's Mm -hmm. best for the client. No. And it's not sustainable. No, it's not. At and all. It's part of what makes community mental health so hard on therapists. Yeah, definitely. And like you said, even some group practices. Um, mm-hmm. I know I was given like a few choices of like maybe age or mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah. Or here's like something I definitely don't have training in, like couples mm-hmm. or something. But yeah. other than that, it was just like, here you go. So. Yeah. Like, yeah, I had to make my own business so I could really go ahead and niche down finally. Um, But also it took a long time, like I said, to find that. So I love that you're helping people maybe fast track that process Mm -hmm. by giving them exercises and things to work with them on and helping with the copy piece. Cause I think that intimidates a lot of therapists. Cause again, it's something we were not taught in grad school, marketing and, you know, writing, we all wrote papers. And it's, it's something that we as therapists aren't really, not only are we not trained in, but it's uncomfortable Mm -hmm. for a lot of therapists. Like if I think about like, I spent probably four years working on my website and Mm -hmm. like, I actually hated every minute of it. (laughs) And then when I started this, like I started the copywriting business doing blogs and everybody kept asking me to do websites. And finally I agreed to do one. And it was so much fun because it's like, I'm not trying to sell myself here. I'm selling someone else and I'm selling a therapist who I've sat and I've talked to and I've gotten to know her or him. And I, I can sell them. Yeah. Like I, I get to sell you. I get to tell all of your clients, your ideal clients, like what is so great about you and why you're the right fit for them. And that's so much fun. Like, oh, yeah. so it was so horrible to write my own, but writing <laughs> someone else's, being able to like tell the world about this particular therapist and how cool they are and like what they do. It's, it's super fun. Like I love doing it. So, Oh, that's awesome. Cause I think most people feel like you did like almost mm-hmm. like icky. Like I feel like I'm selling myself yeah. or do I talk yeah. about myself in the third person or like, how does this work? And like, there's too much mm-hmm. thought that goes into it and anxiety yeah. that they just yeah. like freak out and either don't do it or just like throw something together that really doesn't mm-hmm. best reflect who they are and what they do. Yeah. So yeah, 
And so that's what I really specialize in is I specialize in using your voice, your tone, and like really, really like what I do is not a formula website. Like I really focus on like what you, what you do best and like showing your clients who you are so that like when they come in the room with you, it's not a surprise. And they like, they know when they call you for your consultation or when they go into the first session, who they're getting and that you're going to be the right fit for them. And that does every, that saves everybody time and it's a service for everybody. So I really enjoy doing it. Oh, that's so nice. That's great though. Cause again, that's something that I don't think is talked about enough. So I like that you've been able to put your skills and talent to use in a way that helps other therapists, especially when, you know, being mm-hmm. on the, I guess in this way, the client side as the therapist <laughs> with the copywriting, mm-hmm. knowing how uncomfortable it can be to put all that together and being able to take that off somebody's hands, but also help them see the best parts of themselves through yeah. that writing. Yeah. Which yep. is sweet. So well, below the video, I'm going to link everything, the website, right. everything, so people can see mm-hmm. it and find you if they need that service, which I think right. most people actually do. <laughs> so hopefully they reach out. To, but um, I just appreciate you taking the time to do this today, especially this early. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed it. Hey, well, if you guys want to follow, like I said, everything will be below to be able to mm-hmm. follow Danielle and see what she's up to. Um, if you want to stay in touch and see what's going on in future episodes and subscribe below. And I will see you guys next episode. Thanks. Bye.